um, records a crazy amount of uh, security conferences and, uh, and puts those out available so you can watch them even if you're not able to travel. Um, so we really do appreciate him coming out here and he's going to uh, give us a cool talk about lock picking, some of the games he's made and, and things of that nature. So I'll turn it over to Adrian. Hi, right, Mike. And wouldn't you figure, okay, everything looks like it's functioning. I have a couple different screens and maybe to show people, so I have to swap back and forth between. All right, talking about the C is Lockade, Lock Sport Electronic Games. All right, first of all, I've already been introduced, but um, to follow up on what Dan said, I'm at IronGeek.com. I have an InfoSec education, an interest in InfoSec education, I should say. I also have an InfoSec education, though, quite frankly, I think higher education is not really the place to learn at InfoSec, uh, but I have an interest in educating people, and I don't know anything, I may get some things wrong, if I say something wrong, like if I talk about the structural strength of lexan versus, you know, polycarbonate uh, versus, I say, uh, acrylic, I might get something wrong, so let me know. Also, I'm um, a senior information security consultant at TrustedSec. Give Dave a big hug at any conference you see, we'll give him the time off to come to some of these cons and record, and I'm also a co-founder of DerbyCon. And I also click buttons too fast. Okay, very quick intro to lock picking. This talk is not really about lock picking. However, I think I should explain some basic concepts before uh, I go too far. And this means I have to run off stage and grab another many bits of kit that I have to bring with me. Let me see if I can find the proper piece of equipment in here that I wanted to find. Unfortunately, this particular talk is somewhat on the prop heavy side. Yeah, I believe that's the correct one. Okay, here's the way a lock, uh, well, how lock clicking works. Uh, you use imperfections in the lock and your understanding of how a lock works to be able to, well, essentially um, make it open without having the proper key. Uh, as far as criminality of this, Adrian, yes, question. yes. How is it an imperfection? It's an imperfection because if everything, the pin stack were perfectly aligned, like perfectly drilled, you wouldn't necessarily have one that binds before the other. Without one binding before the other, you'd have to get all of it at the exact same time by using essentially the key. Well, isn't it essentially the job to bind the pin? But if they were all perfectly aligned, if every last uh, drilled hole was perfectly aligned, that would be incredibly difficult. Um, it's still the imperfection, though. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about when we show how a lock actually works. Um, breaking and entering is easier. If someone wants to get into a place, really, as far as criminals are concerned, generally, unless they want to get in surreptitiously, they're going to break a lock. They're going to, we'll say, they'll break down the door. They're going to bust through a window. But keep in mind that laws vary from state to state as far as lock picking is concerned and possession of lock picks. The only one I know that's like outright illegal to have militia locksmith, I believe, is Tennessee. But it might be a few others. And the other states have like weird laws. Like I was told in Illinois, you can have them, but you can't transfer them. But it is illegal if you have them while well, you're um, actually doing something illegal because it's um, an extra charge to possession of burglary tools. However, they have to show intent. So if you just happen to have them, and a good reason to have them, you're probably not going to get in trouble. Um, the, the tool, which is an organized association for lock sport, has a big um, article on uh, laws in different states you might want to check out. If you Google for um, lock picking laws, it's probably the first thing that's going to come up. But I'm going to talk a little bit about picking a few uh, basic types of locks. We'll talk a little bit about warded locks, pin tumbler locks, and waiver locks. So I'm going to walk over here just to make sure I have what I can demo. I believe, oh yeah, those are some of my warded locks. Yeah, I walk around HackerCon with chains filled with locks so I can demonstrate things. Also, a great self-defense weapon. All right, the first thing we're talking about is a warded lock. Now, the way a warded lock works is essentially you have wards in it and keeping can, keep can turning just any old key. Now, most of them are not going to look like this. Most warded locks you're going to see look like this. And the wards are inside, like in a, well, I guess in a circular pattern. And if you have the right key, which looks something like this one, you can turn it because it has all the right slots cut into it where none of the wards will block it and you can just keep turning. That's one type of lock, and you usually pick those with a certain, uh, well, essentially skeleton keys. The thing about these is they generally have such huge imperfections that 
there's a set of common um, wooded uh, lock picks that you can use that will pretty much cover all your bases for picking most any wooded lock. For example, let me pull this up here in a second. This is why I have the webcam hooked up. Getting the hold still, different issue. That is my set of, or one of my sets of wooded lock picks. And essentially, it's as easy as using, well, the key. You've got to find a lock that should work on. Um, let me see if I have one here. This master lock may or may not be an appropriate one. Put it in, find what's springy, pop the lock like it's a freaking key. Uh, there is no, nothing to it. Uh, but that's a sample of a warded lock. And you'll see those, those are usually the bottom basement ones. And some that are really, really crappy um, are like the cheapest, I think the cheapest lock you can find at Walmart is like a, what is it, Mountain Fortress or something? Or Mountain Security. And you don't even need to buy one of these warded locks yet. But you usually find another key of that same, or another lock of that same brand, take its key, file off everything down its edges except for the very tip. Essentially, at the risk of sounding crude, you're making the key look like a penis. You take down all the sides, and then you can just stick it in and turn it. Now, the master lock ones are a little bit more complicated than that, uh, but not by a whole, whole lot. Actually, I'm making sure... I had some camera synchronization problems earlier, so I'm making sure that it's still running. Testing out new rigs for upcoming conferences. I'm going to be recording six tracks at B-Sides Las Vegas, and I want to make sure all this stuff works. And then five tracks at DerbyCon. Okay, that's basically how a watered lock works. And you can find out more about that on Wikipedia. By the way, a lot of the um, images you'll see, this one I think I got from uh, Wikipedia, but some of the ones you'll see I got from Debian Olam, who spoke here last year. Next up, we'll talk a little bit about wafer locks. Wafer locks are generally considered to be crap, but they don't have to be. Like your car probably has a wafer lock, and it's going to be a lot tougher than the average lock you see on a desk. But the way a wafer lock works is, um, since you have these wafers that you see in here, and when a proper key is inserted, it lifts each one of the wafers out of this groove down at the bottom, so you can actually turn the key. And I have a little example of a wafer lock here that I essentially took apart just for these kind of events. And let me switch back over to this camera. Alright, this is my wafer lock. You may have seen these in all sorts of desks. The way you can tell it's a wafer lock... Actually, let me go step back a second. The way you can tell a water lock usually, if you look down the keyway and it looks like that, you don't see any pins or wafers um, coming down, that's generally going to be a watered lock. Um, in the case of a wafer lock, you're going to look down it and you'll probably will see it, and it might be too dark, flat pieces, not like rounded pins but little flat pieces. You see how I do the lighting different. You know what? This is really hard to hold and move when you're used to doing like a mirror. <laughs> yeah, you'll see little flat pieces in there. There you go. That's a good shot. Uh, and the way I was saying it worked is there's these grooves in it. So if I take this out of here, you'll notice those, these little grooves. What happens is, this get, those little wafers come down far enough to where they lock in the grooves. However, when the proper key is inserted into one, and I'm not even sure I have the proper key, you'll notice that proper key inserted should push those out of the way, and then it becomes a smooth surface that you can turn it. And they pop back down. So that's basically how a wafer lock works. And you pick that pretty much the same way, well, I guess you sort of pick it the same way as you can um, a pin tumbler lock, which I'll talk about next. However, generally you just sit there and rake it. You essentially put a little bit of tension and just start raking back and across with um, whatever pick you choose to use that you think works the best for you. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of something called a DeForest Offset Diamond. And um, let me bring this up. You know, showing off lock picking stuff, it's good to have everything zoomed up on the screen because some of these things are a little tiny. Like that's a DeForest offset diamond. And I usually have really good luck with these. They're very small and easy to use on locks of small keyways. Like, um, you may be familiar with the TSA locks. These are special locks that the uh, TSA agents can open up with a special key that they have so that they don't have to cut your locks off when they, if they want to inspect your luggage that's going through an airport. Every TSA lock I've ever encountered is crap. Well, the whole idea of a, 
a lock that a single key or a single set of keys can open is pretty much you know, doomed to failure from the beginning. But they have small keyways sometimes, and this is really great for opening up those. And um, let me see, move back here. But that's how one of those works. Then there's a pin tumbler. Now, this is the artwork that Devin uh, came up with, or something that he, either he did or someone at Tool did. And uh, this is going to illustrate how an actual pin tumbler lock works. Your door lock is most likely a pin tumbler lock with five pins. Most master locks, you're going to have like um, padlocks. They're going to be like four. Uh, but the way one works, and you can see in the illustration, uh, let me see if I can move my mouse pointer. Right here, once everything is lifted above the shear line by the proper key, all, all these pins have certain cut depths in them. This is called a driver pin, because it's the one that's pressing down or up. We usually think of, some people call it the top pin. If you go to some other country, it's not going to be the top pin necessarily. Other countries sometimes hang the lock the opposite way. So a better term is the driver pin, these blue pins that touch the spring. The key pin, of course, touches the key. And what you do is you have different key pins of different depths, and if you have the proper key in it, it lines them all up, the shear line here, and you can then turn it like you see right here. You see misaligned one with the wrong key, properly aligned one with the correct key. Well, the idea behind lock picking is use imperfections in how the holes are drilled and um, maybe not perfect pins and the various other little problems to be able to get things to lock up above the shear line. So what you do is you apply a very little bit of tension, and those, uh, I, I don't know if I have a good illustration of this. Let me check the next one. No, I don't have a top-down view. Let me switch over to the webcam to give you a better idea then. And I'm not going to actually sit here and pick this one because this one, while you can actually see the pins, it's sort of a pain to pick. Um, this here is a transparent lock for demoing how to pick locks. And right now, all you see probably is the uh, driver pins. So. If I can get this thing aligned, this would be a lot better. So all you right that's now do you see right now is uh, yeah that's not gonna be high enough. They actually make things that are just for this kind of demos. Oh yeah, that lighting is beautiful. Okay, you can see the pins in it, and if the proper key is put in, they're all gonna line up, and you'll be able to turn the lock. So let me actually grab the right key. That's the wrong key, so I'm going to put, use the wrong key first. Insert that, and you'll see that they're misaligned, and you can see how I've actually driven some of the key pins up into and past the shear line. If you put in just the right key, well, they all line up. Let me see if we can do it as I insert it. It's hard not to get glare on here. They line up, and you can turn the cylinder. The way lock picking works, well, at least with pin tumble locks, is what you do is you try to apply the slightest bit of tension. That's the number one thing people screw up, is they apply too much tension. And you can try to get each pin, you try to feel for the one that's binding, the one that has a little pressure on it. Then you press it up and you try to, and I can't do it while holding like that, but let's see if I can get one of them up. Yeah, I may not quite have it there, but um, let's say that second pin in, I might have it bound right above the shear line. Actually, it looks like um, maybe the one farthest, the second from farthest in, I have right above the shear line. Now, when I was talking about imperfections and how they drill it, if they drilled all those holes into it almost perfect, that would make the lock a lot harder to pick. But, I mean, there's certain tolerances. The higher tolerances you get, the harder and more expensive it is to make. And generally, when it comes to locks, if you make something too expensive, people aren't going to buy it. And to tell you the truth, my front door lock isn't nothing really great. It's um, it should be pretty easily pickable, and I bumped it before too. I'll talk about bumping in a second. But basically, how you pick lock is you just use those imperfections. You put a little bit of pressure, and you feel where it binds. Now, I personally actually am suck at lock picking. I can't really feel where a pin binds. I'm not good at single pin picking. But what I've gotten pretty good at is raking. And raking is essentially, well, <sighs> fuzzing the lock. If you're familiar with fuzzing and exploit development, you basically throw shit at it until it opens. Uh, so you you. Seriously, uh, let me go grab one that should not be too difficult to, um, actually I think I got one here. Mm, now I got a better one. I'm trying to find one of my nice easy ones because it's really embarrassing when you're on stage and you're trying to pick a lock and you totally fail at it. So, obviously, 
I would be lame and choose something simple. And I know someplace in here, I should have, I would have a small master lock that will open. Well, you know what? I think I'm going to use this one. Hopefully this one will work okay. If not, I've got a couple of these. These are like master lock number threes. A lot of people like to start off practicing on these because they're so easy, um, generally speaking. You can tell it's a master lock number three because it says number three at the bottom. And um, basically you just apply a little bit of tension. And nice thing about master locks also for teaching yourself is it doesn't matter which way you turn the lock. Either way, you can make it turn. And you basically, let's see if I can do this while on stage. Now you didn't see me hold it down there, but pop the lock by basically raking across it. And essentially it just bound the pins up and sort of like fuzzing it. Now, like I said before, I like the thaw offset for almost everything. I mean, it's my go-to pick. But there's tons of different rates that have different shapes to them that are good for raking inside the lock. Like, this one is based around a Bogota. It's sometimes called a, a rave rake. Um, but that's a common one you see people use. That's one of my other favorites to carry with me. There's also something some people refer to as an L rake, which generally looks like this. But different locks, you know, respond to different picks. Um, you just gotta try it, try different raking techniques. I mentioned a bow guitar earlier. Bow guitars are kind of neat. Uh, I think they originally were made by oh, Raimondo, I think it's the guy who originally made them, um, out of street sweep of bristles. But um, I've made some improvised ones out of uh, windshield wiper blades. By the way, keep your windshield wiper blades or bring them to me. They make great tension wrenches, or tension tools as David likes to call them. And uh, what you do is you can put a rake pattern in the other end, so you, when you use them, you use one in the lock to apply tension while you're raking with the other. Um, here are some that are actually professionally made. They're made out of some kind of titanium alloy. They're nice if you have nothing else to carry with you. Uh, I'd rather have a full pick set still. And also, I think the titanium alloy is largely a gimmick. They talk about low magnetic profile. Okay. It's still going to get detected by a metal detector if it's sensitive enough because it's magnetic doesn't matter. It's conductive that matters to a metal detector. Not that I spend a lot of time trying to get past metal detectors or anything. Okay. Let me put that away just after I explain that. Okay. Um, so, there's ways you, they can make a lot more difficult to pick. Like, uh, here's a few different uh, types of safety pins, or sorry, security pins. So here's your normal, well, a normal pin doesn't have any kind of serrations in it. This one is a spool pin. And you see how when it gets pushed up, there's a spot where it can bind an extra spot and makes it harder to be able to get it past that shear line. There's also ones that are mushroom, serrate, and uh, I think this one might be considered serrated. And uh, there's another mushroom one, and that's a picture that Debbie put together to illustrate how you can kind of pick them still by feeling where it sets one time, seeing it turn back, and then turn it again. I have had a whole lot of luck with these kinds of um, locks, so I can't tell you a whole lot of uh, one, much about ones with security pins. Um, other than that, it would be a pain in the butt to pick. There's also something called lock bumping. Lock bumping is kind of cool. Uh, essentially, instead of picking it, and security pins don't matter on this one, unless it's a pin that there's ways around to stop lock bumping also. That involves like different weight pins, different strings of strings, and a few other items. Uh, with lock bumping though, you ever see those Newton cradles where you pull back a ball and it goes bounce, 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 bounce? You're doing the same thing with the pins in the lock. You smack something in, you smack the key in, and then you turn at the same time with a light bit of pressure, and hopefully you get all the driver pins up into the cylinder, the key pins fall down first, and during that brief bit of time, you can turn the lock. Now, you can do that using, uh, I think it's sometimes referred to the 999 key, depending on the key type, but generally it's a key that has all of its depths taken down to the lowest level. And I didn't explain that before, but keys also have depth levels. For instance, you can read that with an interpreter and know a number for that particular depth, and if you have the number for your key, you can go and get a new key made for that lock, even if you don't have any of the keys for it. For instance, when I got various um, master locks at a hardware store, if you look on the back of them, you'll see the key code. And sometimes you'll notice a whole, like five of them in a row that all have the exact same key code. And which kind of is cool if you're trying to buy one with the same lock for everything. But it also means if you see somebody um, leaving that bought that thick little lock, you might want to visit our house later after you buy one yourself so you can break into the shit. Um, I don't know. It's not maybe the most secure practice in the world. 
but you can actually read those depths and get the key reproduced by number. Now, my electronic games, when I'm picking out the various conferences, please don't bump them because they're a little bit more sensitive. And bumping is semi-destructive. I mean, it's not good for the lock to have someone hammering on it with a key. Um, now, that brings me, after I've basically explained how lock picking works, is there any question about how lock picking works in general? That was a super quick overview, and you're much better off watching Debian's talk later on. Any questions about how locks work right now? Okay, I'm going to go on to talk about practice aids then. Now, generally, when you go to most um, lockpick villages, or lockpick pavilions, whatever they want to call themselves, you're going to see people um, with these, like lock towers that they'll have up there that you can try to pick. Also, you'll see things like these progressive locks, which essentially are pinned to have one pin, two pin, three pin, four pin, so that you can practice on one that's an easier lock. Because the less pins you have, generally speaking, the easier the lock's going to be. So those progressives are nice. I think actually most sets start out with two and go up to six pins. Some of your more high security, well, some of my high security door locks have six pins instead of normal five. And this is an example of a tower. Ah, Dogs, man. Essentially, taught me put it together. I like it because we got a oh, can't, derby kind of logo etched into it. Um, but this is how a lot of people practice lock picking. Essentially, this drill a bunch of holes in a board. Uh, I think this is a 2x8, 2x6, and um, mount locks in it and go to town. And that's not a bad way to practice, but I started thinking maybe there's something cool that we can do. And D Dogs Man has always um, done some pretty cool things. Oh, also there's these transparent locks that you can use for practice. But really, this one's hard to get to, ones to bind up. It's good for illustrating how a lock works. It's not so great for practice, because also in reality, you're not going to be able to see into the lock. Well, at least not from the side. Oh, that brings me to DOS Man. Now, my real man from DOS Man, I think, started in like 2004 or so. I was looking around for other hacker video uh, podcasts, and I found him. And I found out, oh, he only lives two hours away from me. We met up at um, uh, Freaknik 2005, and he had some lock stuff there, I believe. And um, he was really big in the lock sport. I didn't really get into it until like about a year ago. But um, he made all these games that I thought were pretty awesome. And his um, local hacker space is Blooming Fools in Bloomington, Indiana. And he even has a little web page out there on uh, some of the lock picking games they made. What you see here in the background is the Rumble Challenge, which I'll get to in a bit. It involves drinking and lock picking. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong with that. All right. One of the first games that inspired me was Doss Man's uh, Ammo Can Bomb. And this is a contest that he had, I think it, I think it was at WCon 2, where, um, I think it's brought up the other ones, where the idea is you try to pick the lock as fast as you can before the timer runs out. Whoever has the most time left wins the game. If you don't do it within a certain amount of time, it simulates the blowing up. It also, he's done some more neat things in it, like I think he has a, uh, a tilt switch in it. So there's some tamper stuff to keep you from, you know, trying to bypass the locks in other ways. Uh, but that kind of inspired him. It's like, oh, that's kind of a cool idea. Uh, he actually refused to send me the pictures of this without using a, a PTP because uh, he didn't want, well, essentially, this is kind of the same as a bomb other than you're hooking it to a buzzer instead of a, a detonator. So, but it's, Pretty cool and inspired me to start doing my, some of my own. But a thing that he put together that was really fascinating is the Rumble Challenge. And usually we just use it for playing for time and see who can pick the fastest. Um, I went to the game at Circle City Con, so I got a, like a hundred dollar gift certificate, certificate for hacker stickers and bought a bunch of loaner picks so I could put them in my games. But the way this thing works is when you uh, pick a lock, it pours you a shot and everybody else a shot. You get points for each shot you drink, but you also get points depending on how fast you pick the lock. However, once you've picked your lock, you sit out after drinking your drink, and other people keep the drink, keep drinking. So it's possible to be the worst lock picker, but the drunkest person there, and still win the game. <laughs> to tell you the honest truth, the rules are a little bit baffling to me. I'm not always, you know, I don't always follow them. Maybe because I've been playing the game while I was trying to understand them. But there's also a scoreboard in the background, which I think my Dawson's friends put together. The guy you see there is Zach. Uh, yeah, Zach's interesting. That's all I'm going to say about Zach. Uh, it's actually a great guy. But you see them having the Rumble Challenge set up. I think that was at DerbyCon. Unfortunately, uh, the hotel usually has rules about alcohol, so we have to play for time in the hotel. But occasionally you'll find someone may have dragged one up to the room party or um, has uh, brought it to the local hacker space to uh, play with. But it, it pours your shot as you pick. I mean, who wouldn't like that? He's got like, an improvised vibration motor in it to, um, to you know, throw you off. He's got like an overvolted aquarium pump to pump the booze. 
and uh, a bunch of tubing and that display board I mentioned before, which I think a friend of his came up with to show who's picked so far, who's finished, what the time was. So that's a couple games that he's made, and that's kind of inspired me. Talk a little bit about gamification. I'm going to go ahead and just read the definition from Wikipedia. Gamification is the use of game thinking and game mechanics in non-game context to engage users in solving problems. Now in my case, I'm thinking of um, using this for lock picking and the way Dossman did. It's a great way to teach people how to pick locks because it's kind of more interesting just picking a lock by itself. People sometimes like scoring systems. They like a sense of competition. Also, it's kind of like going to the gym and not keeping track of um, how much you benched this one time or how many reps you did. You don't know if you're making progress or not if you don't have some kind of metrics. With these games, you have metrics. You know how long it took you to pick a lock. And it's good to see, you know, you're building up um, and seeing your progress. And some people are really competitive, so if you have a game, it's kind of fun to sit there, you know, have a few drinks at the con, play a lock picking game, and see who can beat the other people. And uh, games can make things, you know, that was kind of one thing, a lot more interesting. So, my idea was, can I make one? I had a few uh, limitations. I didn't have a whole lot of uh, tools. I wanted to do everything on the cheap. That ended pretty quickly. I've now bought a bunch of tools mostly just for doing these games. Uh, I wanted to also make mine a little bit more flashy than DOS Man's. Uh, though not necessarily more flashy. Well, my ammo can more flashy. Not necessarily the Rumble Challenge. I have my own version of that in the works, hopefully. I wanted to be simple to code and uh, I wanted to use crap I had laying around. So my idea was I took an ammo can and this is what I came up with. I got a Harbor Freight ammo can and essentially um, did some modification to it to put in some uh, plexiglass that I had. And, uh, oh, by the way, that is because it ran out of time and blew up. It's resetting itself. Uh, so, I basically made my own version of it, which I'll show in more depth here a bit. But here's the parts to it. I took a bunch of cam locks. Essentially, a cam lock is um, a lock that you normally going to see in desks and so forth. Like, here's some cam locks. I got them all mounted on a little board. Let me move this back up. Yeah, these are a bunch of cam locks. Essentially, you'll see these in desk drawers and so forth. A lot of times, those crappy wafer locks, you can look around, though, for some that are other types. Like, this is a tube. I'm pressing the wrong one. Tubular lock, a cross lock. That's really hard when it's not a mirror. That's a cross lock. Uh, more tubular locks. And at one time, I had what's called a disc detainer lock in there, but I don't have it right now. And the idea is when you turn the lock, it's actually turning this cam out of the way. Wait, turn the cam out of the way. So it gets out of the way of the desk drawer or whatever you have the cam lock in, and you can pull it, pull out the desk drawer. But the nice thing with these is they're easy to mount because you only have like a three-quarter inch hole or a special double D hole, which I'll forgot where I had it. A special double D hole, which makes them a lot easier to mount than like door locks, and they're smaller, so you can do little electronic games with them. Uh, a plastic ammo can from Harbor Freight that's fairly inexpensive. I had a bunch of plexiglass laying around because I used to work for uh, the New Albany Paper Mills Library and they happened to move to a new library building and they had all these little plastic plexiglass sheets covering up like the call numbers and they were leaving the building and they were just going to get scrapped. I was like, I'll use these later. And then about 10 years later, I used them. I still have a few left. I'm a bit of a pack rat in case you can't tell. Okay, so the plexiglass in there, I also used something called a Tensi 2.0 because I had them laying around. A Tensi is a little microcontroller Dave was talking about earlier for using security. My original interest in the Tensi was you can make it act as a keyboard, but uh, you can also make it act as a very nice little microcontroller for hooking things to. Uh, if you want to do like sensors or um, switches and have it do different things. I also have what's called an I2C serial LCD. This is a little LCD display that takes four lines, two for power, two for data, and you can throw up text on it. And there's a bunch of um, jumpers, and also use something called beading wire. You ever see, go to like the craft section, there's these little crafts for little girls where you can put beads on these wires. Well, that stuff is really useful for some electronic projects where you just need to have a conductor that's open to the air and wrap it around things to make sure everything's grounded. So I use that for a lot of my stuff. And uh, here's essentially how it worked. And I think this graphic got screwed up at one point. Um, uh, well, I guess it still looks okay. Somehow, when you're moving between different versions of Office OS X and to Windows, things get screwy. But essentially, I have an input on the Tensi, and I have a bunch of little posts that are grounded. I have a neodymium magnet on each one of these, really powerful magnet, so when that cam comes over and touches the metal post, it sticks. 
so it doesn't bounce up and down. I also have code in there. A bounce, by the way, when you actually touch a switch, you get it touching, untouching, touching, untouching in the sense in like <coughs> microseconds. So that would read as different, you know, ons and offs. You don't want that to happen. So you put stuff in the code to say, oh, is it closed now? Oh, it's, it's switched on? Okay. Let me check again. Is it really switched on? So you check over multiple times. But the magnets help with that. And basically, I'm just reading whether or not the lock is now grounded. And uh, based on that, I say whether or not the lock is locked. Huge flaw of this original design. You might be able to see it in a bit. Uh, actually, I'll probably demonstrate it. All of this is hooked up also to the screen, and I also have this little RGB LED just for the hell of it, just because I think it's pretty. So, let me actually show what came out of all this. Now, hopefully I can unplug this and keep it going. Well, that was ever so slightly unexpected. Alright, let me put this crap back together. Yeah, I'm going to make something that's a little bit more, well... Does it live? Uh, not quite yet. Hold on, let me power cycle this thing one more time. Yeah, I didn't quite expect the lid to come off. Okay, here we go. Now it's going again. Essentially, let me get my keys out of the way. You just have a countdown, and you have these little icons to say whether or not a lock is locked or not. And the idea is to get as much time as you can. By the way, you, you might notice that is so. You know what? I think I know what ha what's happening. I think that the battery that I put in there, the improvised battery, well, kind of sucks. We'll get to you in a second. Shut up. <laughs> Damn, that voice is annoying. Okay, let me see if this thing will power back on now. Well, don't you just love it when you're trying to demo something and you destroy your project as you're about to demo it? Let me see. This is one of the downsides to me using jumpers for almost everything is it's not necessarily the most rugged affair. Cool. That's going again. I'm going to leave you plugged in, and I'm going to gently move you. Yeah, I got new games that are going to be more ruggedly built than this. Actually, Dave wanted me to build a bunch of these ammo cans for um, picking whatever trust tech sponsor someplace and has a table, because it gives you know, salespeople a chance to play with the game. Well, it gives uh, people a chance to play with the game while the salesperson can talk to them. But essentially, we just have a countdown. And we have this little lock icon to show where our lock is locked. And since I'm going to have a really hard time picking that while I'm standing up here and uh, holding it, I'm going to have to put it back down for a second. And so once you pick one, and hopefully you'll see a flashing. Once one's picked, uh, man, I think I broke something as I was doing that. Okay, when it actually comes up, we should see that one of the locks says it's now picked. And you see what I did was, I basically turned that cam and made it touch the post. It says pick zero, and you see it says like um, more than one is picked now. Because somehow or another, the electronics in this accidentally broke when I dropped it, and it says it's now picked. We'll talk about building ruggedness, ruggedness into your games later on. <laughs> but the idea is essentially to pick it as fast as you can and have as much time on the clock as you can. It also keeps changing colors as it gets closer and closer to time, so it's like, you know, trying to rush you on. So let me set this aside and try not to break it again. But that came out pretty good. Really, I probably should have demonstrated on this thing instead. This is a much more refined version, which were... Oh man, what the hell am I hooked on to? How did I do that? <laughs> okay, yeah, you're coming undone. Believe it or not, I've actually kind of practiced the speech one. Okay. Organized chaos. Yeah, this is the pick boy. And essentially, same kind of thing, but I have um, six locks in it. And I think I have like a, I think I put a two pinner, a three pinner, four pinner, no, one pinner, two pinner, three pinner, four pinner, I think two five pinners in the middle. And it's very really much the same kind of thing. It's got the same kind of uh, lock uh, icons. 
And I just pick it as fast as you can. This one, though, has a color-changing screen. You can play that during lunch if you want. I'll have that on some table someplace. Uh, that one's much more readily built. Now, that brings me to switching mechanisms. The way I've been doing it, um, well, there are actually keyed switches you can go buy. Um, unfortunately, most of them are pretty cheap. A lot of them are really small. A lot of them are way too simple to really teach you how to lock pick. So I wanted to use something that was actually used to really secure something. I mean, most uh, switches are just to make sure you don't accidentally trip. Most of the switched keys are just there to make sure you don't accidentally trip some electronics. Um, there is the medical free pan electric uh, switch key, but uh, that's kind of expensive what I found. Dawson used one, though, in one of his games. So what I came up with was essentially just a cam and a metal post. And what you do is um, when that cam touches the metal post, it becomes grounded. You have another line leading off to the tensity, and you can read it and say, oh, you're now locked. However, there is indeed a huge flaw with that particular plan. And I'm going to try to illustrate that here in a second. And that is, let's say you have one locked. Actually, let's say you have one locked already. Well, since the other one's, like, one's already grounded, you can touch it to another lock, and that other lock becomes grounded without ever picking it. I've changed that pattern in the newer one, where essentially I'm reading off of the uh, touch post instead of reading from the lock, because you can't directly touch the touch post from outside the enclosure. But that was a flaw in my original game. Uh, but that's how I did my switching mechanisms for the cam locks. And I will explain basically what a cam lock is. One thing you want to be aware of when you're going out to search for cam locks, you want to make games, is those ones that have nuts and those ones that have bolts. For instance, uh, sorry, ones that have clips. This has clips, this one has nuts. So you want to make sure that your cam, lock, cam locks have nuts. You don't want nutless cam locks. Because those ones that are nutless are awfully hard to actually install because you have to have a very thin piece of sheet metal or a very thin piece of plastic that you can fit that clip against. There's actually a, a model I bought from um, HL Flake, which is an online company that sells a bunch of lock products that has both a cam and a clip, so it's like the best of both worlds. But um, if, when I can, I try to find one that has uh, a bolt, uh, sorry, a, a nut that you screw on. And that's this one outside here. All right. Most of these cam locks you're going to find in America use either a 3 fourths inch hole or a special double D hole. If you actually looked at the cam lock straight on, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it from what I have mounted here, but uh, like this is a certain type of cam lock that's a padlock hasp. But you notice it has a flat side because if you look out straight, if you could look out straight on it, didn't have that cam on it, you would be able to notice that it's got that flat side. So it's not like a perfect uh, three quarter inch hole. And that flat side's there to keep people from spinning the lock because you can put it into that double D hole and it's not going to move. And uh, that became pretty important. I wish you made three quarter inch holes in uh, this lock pick game. The problem is novice pickers, one of the bad things they do is they apply way too much pressure on the game or on the lock. And so they'll end up moving it inside the hole and moving the entire lock instead of actually picking the lock. So I'm now trying to make double D holes, which are essentially like 5 eighths inch across and 3 fourths this way, an outer circle that now has flat sides on the, you know, right and left or whatever, is 3 fourths inch. So it basically looks like this. I found a couple ways of doing this. Um, you can try to drill a 3 fourths uh, inch hole and then tighten everything down so tight that they can't turn it. That's kind of hard to do in plexiglass. You can use a 5 eighths inch drill and try to dremel out everything else. I found I can use a 5 eighths inch hole saw and drill two holes, top and bottom, and then do a little bit of um, filing or dribbling out. And you can make some approximating this double D hole. You can also use something called stabilizing plates, which are basically uh, pieces of metal that, like this one, that are already shaped that way, and you can try to glue those into the game. And there's a bunch of different models of um, stabilizing plates. By the way, this is all going to be up online, uh, hopefully here shortly. When I post the videos, I'll make sure I have a uh, link to this uh, PowerPoint slide presentation as well, so you can find these problems anybody wants to create these games. Another thing I found you can do is, uh, if you're just doing it to plastic, you can make your own hot punch, essentially. What I do is I find a stabilizing plate, put a piece of copper in it, I think, it's a, I think it was a half inch tube of copper, and then heat it up, put it in that stabilizing plate, and stretch it out to fit the outer edge. Then, whenever I actually want to uh, punch a hole, I heat that up with a, a torch, Plunge it right through the plastic. Yeah, noxious fumes, brain cells dead, you know. Not that I need them anyway. But 
that, you know, worked pretty freaking well. And it makes a very good double D hole so that, you know, pickers aren't spinning the lock instead of actually turning the cylinder. Also, if you've got a laser cutter, I now have a pattern on my notes page that, that will allow you to create these little plates um, that if I can find where I did of them, um, will illustrate something pretty cool. Let me see if I have my plates in here. That's a plate. And let me see if I have my neodymium magnet. Now here's a nano neodymium magnet. Basically, you can cut these things out if you have a laser cutter, and they have a perfect double D hole in it, and they have a little square hole or rectangular hole that hold a certain size of neodymium magnet, specifically a uh, five by three millimeter. And the way that works is let me switch back over. You can now mount the lock even in a round hole. Put this behind it. Have this sticking out. You may have to use two of the plates. And you can use this as your touch point. You wrap the wire around that, and that becomes your switch. Since it's a magnet, as soon as the, uh, as a conductive magnet, since it's neodymium, as soon as uh, that touches, it makes an awesome switch. Also, that back plate, I basically made a pattern that should fit perfectly in one of these ammo cans. So if you have a laser cutter, that basically will cut out everything that, you know, I did the hard work of drilling and not trying to break the plastic glass for you. So, I really want a laser cutter, but I don't actually have one. Sadly. But that's one way of um, improving the switching on these. And I've got a bunch of these plates made up. And hopefully Dawson is going to create me some more here in a bit. But uh, that's him actually cutting those plates out with the laser cutter at Blooming Fools. Alright, the main board I use, as I mentioned before, is Tinsy. That's not too expensive, it's like 16 bucks. Uh, and I have a bunch of laying around from other projects. One of the reasons you see, and one reason that thing is so fragile, is as a prototype, I use all jumpers because I want to reuse the Tinsy later on. So, eh, that's one problem with how I designed that one. But the Tinsy is nice for prototyping things. You could also use an Arduino Leonardo knockoff. The code I've posted is for the Tinsy, but functionally, you just have to change some pin numbers and it should work no problem with the Leonardo, or even an older um, Arduino for that matter. A bunch of jumpers I use just for prototyping. I've used power supplies that will take, in theory, like I think nine volts down to five volts. But I keep. Has anybody ever experienced um, power supplies that say to a certain voltage, you plug them in, they're actually like twice? Or I have a bunch of like nine and twelve volt power supplies that seem to start becoming eighteen volts over time, and I'm not sure what happened there. I've blown up some equipment doing that. Uh, a little eight dollar um, sixteen by two serial LCD. Just because it's easy to wire that for display. A normal LCD uses a lot of wires you have to hook up. This thing just has a little uh, backpack on it that makes it nice and easy. And a bunch of neodymium magnets. Also, if you want, you can get a little um, RGB LED so you can uh, have a pretty light show. As you see, this thing's going. I'm gonna turn this thing back up. Yeah, some wires just freaking out and slightly loose because it's um, screwing up the display. I'm gonna try to fix that during lunch. Okay, I thought I already covered types of locks a little bit earlier, so I want to use pin tumble locks for some of these games because pin tumble locks is more likely what you're going to encounter on doors. However, um, most of these can locks you're going to find are wafer locks, like the ones I mentioned before. So I would not have games that had more than just wafer locks in it. There's not much variety in wafer locks, and usually wafer locks are pretty crap, so you can open them all easy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where to source those kind of parts. But a lot of parts I source as far as electronics is from eBay. And a lot of the cheapest stuff is Chinese. It's really slow to get. It's a lot of knockoff items. Um, sometimes you get stuff that's um, suboptimal or broken um, or not quite what you thought you ordered. So uh, if you order something, especially like displays, Google around for code to make sure that whatever board you're ordering actually has usable source code out there before the development environment you use that will work. Like I bought some that there was like no Arduino libraries, so it kind of insinuated that there were. Um, so be careful what you uh, go for, and uh, also it's a time money trade off because while the Chinese stuff is usually cheaper, and I don't own it all comes from China, but ordering direct from China is usually cheaper, but um, it takes a long time. Now as far as pin tumbler options for cam locks for some of these games, this is a bunch of model numbers which is going to be good for you as notes later on if they want to recreate these games that you can find at local uh, hardware stores like Lowell's and um, Carries these. I think the prime lines I found at uh, Home Depot, maybe. Uh, National makes one. You can Google for these and find online uh, retailers. Now, this one is CCL1. I got that one from a company called HL Flake. 
which a, a buddy of mine up in Cleveland told me about. And the nice thing there is you can order stuff in bulk really cheap. And this one is a pin tumbler lock. It also has a clip and a nut. And it's really easy to repin. Some of the ones in uh, that one game I have, where I took it down to like only two pins, I basically used uh, one of their locks, pulled up a strip, took out some of the pins to make it easier. So those ones are easy to repin. I highly recommend them if you want to make little portable games. Other options you have if you want to um, include padlocks in your game is you can uh, essentially make one uh, using a hasp. There's some types of hasp out there. I always show one of these off. This is a type of padlock hasp, and I actually use one similar to this in my gym, where you put the padlock in through that hole, and normally it's locked. Then when you take the padlock out, you let that swing down, and it becomes unlocked. That's one type of padlock hasp, so it's not the most common one. Uh, another type of padlock hasp, and this one you'll see a lot more often, it's called staple hasp. And um, let me see if I can show you and get this close enough without unplugging anything. Okay, you see I have a little padlock there. Now I've left it unlocked for the sake of convenience. There's a little switch right behind there you can see. Essentially that is a normally closed switch and when this is no longer pressing down on it, it reads and um, it knows the lock is now picked, or open at least. We'll talk a little bit more about the pictorial computer here in a bit. So that's another way you can do a switching mechanism on a padlock. Okay, another source, by the way, something I mentioned, a lot of these things are just general notes that I found over time uh, that help people make these games. If you're trying to make a lock picking game and you want cheap locks, you want like cheap door locks, I was looking around for a place and you know, spending for a game, 12 bucks at least usually on a door lock, gets kind of prohibitively expensive for a while. Uh, but if you go out to some place like um, Hyper Humanities Restores, they have a bunch of uh, really cheap locks because vendors like take locks outdoors that they're refurbishing or whatever and they give them to these people to sell and it helps raise money for the charity but you get really cheap locks. For instance, um, now I only got the locks, not the boards or anything but this one uh, game I got right here that I'm just beginning to work on for prototyping I actually bought both of these door locks last night at a, a restore here in Dayton and I think I paid a grand total of six fifty for that, well plus tax. So that's the best in the place that you need to go to check them out. What's that? Yeah, and I've already hit it up for what locks I wanted. I'll have to visit next year also. But I does like three in the Louisville area I didn't know about. I'm going to go visit on my way home, I think. But um, that's a great place for cheap locks. Oh, I want to thank Infosys. She sent me that picture of the one in uh, someplace in the Cleveland area. It had a ton of them. Uh, tools that you might want to use. Originally, I wanted to do this entire thing cheaply. So just the stuff I already had laying around, like pliers, wrenches, screwdrivers, etc. However, um, I quickly found that I cannot do a straight line without proper tools. Um, so these are all things you probably want to have. Dremel Dremel and rotary tools. Dremel is just so useful for so many things. It's nice to have around. A scroll saw is nice to be able to cut things. However, I found my scroll saw, I never could cut a straight edge with it and very, rarely did I ever actually have to make one that was curved in the right way that I could do it with that scroll saw. So I eventually ended up spending, I don't know, 120 something on a table saw so I could actually sit there and cut things nice and straight. Um, other tools I wish I had of course, it's a 3D printer. Because if I had a 3D printer, I can design an enclosure that's much more perfect than this one. This one's from Podtech. I can make one much more uh, perfect than this one and uh, put whatever locks I want in it. Also, uh, well, laser cutters I mentioned before, I really want one of those because so many things you like. And also, I'd like to have uh, a Finbot. If anybody ever invents one of those, give me a yell. It looks like Kez uh, from Blade Runner. That'd be awesome. Uh, now, enclosures you can find that uh, work pretty well for these lockpick games. Those, of course, well, that ammo can, which didn't look so well a second ago, uh, that you can get at Harbor Freight. But once it's enclosed, and assuming you actually hardwired everything and didn't use jumpers like I did, it'd actually be a pretty rugged little enclosure. The only problem is you have a lip there, and it's kind of hard to pick around sometimes. Then there's uh, normal, normal rectangular project boxes. If you want to do something that's similar to uh, this, with just like a little readout, for, like time, like this is a little um, thing that Dawson put together for me for practicing lock picking. It's just a little single block with a single lock in it, uh, no deadbolt or anything for practicing on. You can probably make one of those with those simple little uh, Radio Shack project boxes. But you want to make something a little cooler with an LCD display and all that that's nicely fitted. You don't have to cut the LCD display um, hole out. 
Patek makes a really awesome enclosure, which is that black one I showed right there. On the webpage, you'll see the uh, beige one, I believe. Um, there's also this MT65B, which I got, and uh, it's not bad. Unfortunately, it's very small, and it's not really a battery compartment. But I found that one online, and I don't remember for what price. Okay, that brings me to the Pick Boy, but I've only showed the Pick Boy because of failure that I had earlier with um, the normal uh, ammo can. But the way the Pick Boy is wired inside, I decided to put way, way too many locks inside of it. So it was really hard to get everything in there. So I won't be opening that up again for a while to demonstrate. But essentially, it's all wired. What? What's in the uh, it's all wired in there with a the tensy. Uh, let's see, and it's super glued in there. Uh, sorry, uh, hot glued in there, and everything's like taped around. So it's pretty ghetto once you get inside that box. But it works pretty well, and that's the Pick Boy, which is essentially just the ammo can uh, scaled down. A few tips if you're going to be modifying enclosures for lock picking games: go slow. You know, what, what's the saying? Uh, Use vices and um, workstations so you can have things set and stable. If you're trying to dremel out a hole where you're holding the enclosure in one hand and the dremel on the other, it's hard to do any kind of straight or perfect curve. Uh, measure eight times, cut twice, because I'm really, really sucky at uh, modifying enclosures. I have ruined quite a few enclosures. And I hate ruining an enclosure because usually the enclosure, plastic enclosures cost way more money than they should. I want to say that, that one right there might have been like 13, 14 bucks. It's just a piece of plastic. But I mean, if you want something that looks nice, and unless you can order in massive bulk, you know, what's your options? Uh, try to cut and not melt if you're going to use a Dremel tool. Generally speaking, when you start using a Dremel tool, it's going to get such high rats to go through plastic, it's going to start melting the plastic. So you may want to take that slow. Practice on scrap before you do anything else. Like if you already have plastic laying around, uh, try it out. Uh, generally speaking, aim for a larger enclosure you need. When I first got that black Partec and put six locks in, I was like, oh yeah, this works fine. Well, actually, I put everything together and the electronics inside. Started running out of room pretty quick. Also, keep shit from rattling around. I suppose you can put like foam blocks inside, that'd be one way. Once I have everything mostly the way I want it, I end up going in and hot gluing things down. Alright, other enclosure ideas. Uh, those junction boxes you can get at hardware stores for, elect for uh, electricians. And I don't really think they look that great. There's something called shadow box shelves. Like, there's something you'll see um, these weird things in like Target. They're like these wooden boxes that people are supposed to mount up on the uh, wall and have an extra shelf. But since they're kind of enclosed, I think those would be fairly easy to modify. There's also a plastic gutter pipe, which could be easily modified. And there's something called Crydex, which is essentially this plastic that people make sheaves out of, and also holsters, that you can heat up with a heat, heat gun and then bend it around and form a shape with it. And it locks into that shape once it cools down. Uh, better switching ideas, by the way, than some of the things I discussed earlier. Well, the new a thing cut with a laser cutter, the little washer I showed that has a neodymium magnet, that works pretty well. You can also though, take a piece of, uh, I think it's a half inch PVC pipe, heat it up with a heat gun, slide it onto a cam lock, you have to use one that has a long, long barrel like um, the one that I use for padlocks, and that will shape it to the right shape. When it cools, you pull it off, then what you can do is you can put a switching mechanism on it. Now in this case, I made a little switching mechanism that had another piece of PVC so when it turns, I can have it touch a touch point and trigger. But um, another way of doing that is to put that neodymium magnet on with a bunch of hot glue after wrapping a wire around it, and that became my new switch sensor. And I think that's more or less something similar to what I did in the uh, little pick boy down there. Now, I'm also talking about doing door locks, and my next big thing is I want to make a freestanding version of the pictorial, which I'll show you in a bit. But I want to put door locks in it. And a lot of people take door locks and they don't put the actual deadbolt in it, they just, want, they just put the uh, cylinder in there, but that's not nearly as fun. I like it when I'm turning a lock to have that ka-chunk of the deadbolt sliding. So, you know, there's something satisfying about, you know, that kind of action. So I want to figure out a way to leave the deadbolt in and still get a switching mechanism. I found that there's this little space behind the deadbolt that you can slide a little uh, wheeled switch and make that work okay once you hot glue it in. So that's doable, and that's going to hopefully be in a game that I'm going to try to get finished before DEF CON. Um, other ideas and works in progress, everything's a work in progress. Uh, the Pick Boy, I've already created a new one of it. This was an old prototype that didn't work nearly as well as I'd hoped. Originally, um, this was an enclosure I got, then I found it was way too small. So I modified it, and uh, I screwed up. So what I did was I took a piece of uh, what looked like wood, and added it as an extra layer to cover up all my mistakes and misdrilled holes. 
and now it looks like an Atari 2600. So I call this one the Lot Toy. But by the way, these little cheap pieces of um, wood, or in this case, it's actually fake wood, it's plastic. They actually make wooden blocks you can get at Home Depot. They give away these scraps for floor tiling, but they're awesome for making in fillers for lockpick games. And it's really nice looking wood too, because they put a nice polish on it. Like I think this one's a, a maple. And it's actually real maple. It was free, and uh, I just have to cut it down to the right size. But it's got a great finish on it. It's nice and thick. And I hope to put that in some games later on if I screw up holes. I also think it was free. I can just keep drilling holes if I, if I mess one up and just put in a new filler piece. Um, but yeah, that's the Pictori. Also a problem of it being kind of small. How much time do I got? All right, let me run through this. Uh, but I want to do something called a pictorial computer. And originally I was going to do something like the last toy for this. My original idea for the pictorial computer was I would have an Android-based kiosk. I guess you'd come up and press a button on the screen, and uh, it would give you a tutorial on how to play a video, how to pick a particular lock. When we picked that lock, a sensor would go off and say, oh, you picked this lock. The way I was going to do the sensors was I was going to have um, a Tensi in there that acted as a keyboard. And it would send a keystroke to the... Uh, Android device and trigger whenever um, that happened. And I actually got a lot of the code to work off of that. However, I eventually ended up replacing it with a Raspberry Pi. I'll show in a second. But I mean, it's still doable. One of the things I'm interested in doing is buying me a cheap Android device and make a pictorial that way. But I'd have to program a game for it uh, that would. Uh, I had to program some uh, uh, Arduino software for it. I was going to do it with a web browser and a kiosk piece of software. But I found that won't work because I can't do full screen on a kiosk. So. I have this little game up here, and I'm kind of cheating because I'm not actually picking it. I just have a way I can switch it. But essentially, I have a Tensi in here, and what it can do is it can send these keystrokes. So that when it's tripped, it can queue up a certain video to play. So the idea was we should do something like this for Android. Unfortunately, so far, I can't do it for a web browser on Android. I'm going to come up with my own Android application for queuing and playing videos. Make sure you secure the Android application. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, but the nice thing about doing it with an Android device, I've seen the El Cheapo uh, Android tablets, and as long as they have keyboard support, those should be, I'm tangling myself up some of this, those should be pretty awesome because you ever tried to price a small LCD screen for a game? They get kind of expensive fast. And a lot of these Android tablets are actually cheaper than I can buy the display for the Android tablet. And I'd have Wi-Fi built in, all I have to do is hook up a keyboard interface to it, and I can have a lockpick game. However, I didn't go that way because I couldn't find the particular... Um, tablet I was going to use, and I didn't want to buy one just for it yet, so um, I ended up making it with a Raspberry Pi, which is uh, what I'll have up here next. Essentially, that's the wiring inside of it. Yeah, not, it's, it's painful. Basically, I have uh, little switch mechanisms for all the uh, locks hooked to individual GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. And by the way, uh, the source code for this is all already posted. And the idea is, when you walk up to it, you can uh, push a button, it'll tell you how to pick that lock, and when you pick a lock, it Congratulate you for picking that lock. The parts in it are fairly easy. I use dry erase marker as the backboard so you can actually illustrate you turn the lock this way versus you turn the lock that way. Um, also, uh, that's a rear view screen. Oh, sorry, uh, back, what's that? A backing up screen for your car so you can monitor as you back up. Uh, see. And I also use a Harbor Freight little aluminum case and put everything inside of that. And the way it works is when a video, when a particular lock gets switched, it knows to play a particular video. So let me move over to this, and that's basically what we have right here. So the pictorial, if you want to know how to pick a certain type of lock, you press a button, and a tutorial starts up on it. I need to find a way to amplify the sound on this, because this one's a little bit low. Also, when you open a lock, as I showed before, it tells you which lock you open and congratulates you. I'm working on a more, uh, much bigger version of this, which I hopefully have done uh, before long. Also, I want to get better videos for this, because there's a few locks in this I can't actually pick. So hopefully I can get Dossman to help contribute with some more videos, and maybe find Devi at some place where I have the game and record him real quick. This is the one I'm working on. Um, it's going to be freestanding. Uh, it's going to have door locks in it. It's going to have buttons for pressing for each one of them. Uh, it's going to have like a 10 inch screen or so. I'm going to have like five progressives in it. So you have like a 2 pin, a 3 pin, a 4 pin. And um, I'm trying to find the right screen for it. I blew out the screen, well, I blew out the controller at least for the screen I had bought. So that might be $89 out the drain. 
Uh, I'm still waiting for this control to come in, and in the meantime, I've also ordered something called an um, Elmon uh, 1102A, and what it is is this little B, uh, BGA screen that I'm going to take an HDMI to BGA converter, and you can mount it, hopefully, and I'll be able to use it as my display for this game, but it's still on order, and hopefully it'll come sometime next week. So maybe by the time I do this talk in Cleveland, I'll actually have something. A few of my ideas I have for future games. Um, you lock my battleship, I'm thinking of like a wall of stuff, like I have a wall, you have a wall of locks, and depending on what lock we, we lock, uh, or unlock, it you know, triggers something on the opposite side, something like a battleship game. I thought about Pic-Tac-Toe, which is a similar idea. Oh, Breathalyzer game, I was inspired by Rumble Challenge, but that's competitive, I want a game that people can play individually, but not at the same time. So my idea is, I want to have a game, I already got Roy Buck, the, um, oh wait, the Servo, uh, <laughs> Oh great, I can't remember what the term for it is, a valve. It's like a servo valve. My idea is to like put some whiskey in that and have a glass and a breathalyzer. I would put a breathalyzer too. The idea is you have different difficulties of locks. And before you pick a lock, you gotta blow it into the breathalyzer then start picking. And it's gonna judge your time, the difficulty of the lock, times your blood alcohol content. And I wanna make sure it's web enabled and has a webcam on it. To take pictures each time you pick a lock. But that one, that game's gonna take me a little while to put together. That's a little bit more innate than I originally have. Also, I'm thinking about games like, you know, Reflex and Simon Says and, you know, I've never called one called Simon, oh, Rakes and Ladders, just I think the name is really cool. So I'm trying to come up with new things. Uh, if you have any ideas for lockpick games, share them. I'm still working on getting the pictorial, um, you know, settled out. So eventually though, I wanna move on to the alcohol game, probably next. If you want information on this, I'll be posting this uh, slide hopefully on my Twitter feed uh, sometime today. But I also have a web page that's already out there that has a bunch of notes and code for the games I've designed so far. Uh, quick invite. I uh, hope we all know about DerbyCon. It's coming up in September. Come out if you can. Though the tickets are probably going to be sold out <laughs> by uh, the beginning of September, I imagine. And uh, finally, I'm out of time anyway, but are there any questions? Yes? Have you thought about Every single one I found is way more expensive than I want to spend. Yeah. If I could find one surplus, yes. The problem is, you can find a 19 inch LCD for way cheaper than you can buy a 12 inch LCD. Well, that's, the, that's essentially what I got now with the Raspberry Pi. The problem is finding that screen. Those screens are incredibly pricey for what they are because they're kind of a niche item. They're kind of like barcode readers. The electronics aren't complicated in a barcode reader. There's so few actually need them, and those who need them really need them, that the price is kind of jacked up. Electronics only get cheap when it's mass produced. Yes? Yes? Yeah, I looked around for one, and I couldn't find one that's small that has an HDMI that's not hugely expensive. At the point at which you can find them with HDMI, they're usually no longer backup cameras, they're like monitor cameras for people who do photography. And then they want to jack up the price hugely. So I haven't been able to find one. If you can source one that's under 100 bucks, that's like 10 or 12 inches, let me know. But that Elanon was the closest thing I could find to my specs that I wanted. And it's not high def, it's like 1024 by 600. Yes, ma'am. Well, I have actually whole talks on detecting. There's certain scratches that will be put inside of a lock from lock picking, but that's probably going to be hard to see, and that's a whole talk onto itself. There are people who do lock pick forensics, though. As far as protecting it, get some ones that have security pins, and you probably have to ask uh, the locksmith himself to, to do that for you, or maybe order some security pins online and pin it yourself. Uh, that'd be one way to make it more secure. Some brands are also better than others. Um, but usually a more expensive lock is going to be generally harder to pick. Yes, sir? Um, have you tried to pick them? I've tried to pick gun. I've had no luck with them. I actually have one here with me. But I've had very little luck with a pick gun. Yeah, I've, never used one. I, I've actually had better luck with, with bump keys. I have a pick gun if you want to see it later on. It's in one of these boxes. But um, yeah, I personally haven't had a whole lot of luck with them. Yes? Have you tried looking at the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, screen? Uh, the Raspberry Pi Every single one is way more expensive than a hundred bucks. Other than it's like it's less, it's really, really small one. Yeah, yeah, but it's like a small one. Like I think I picked one up for like three or six bucks. About the same.
there. Yeah, and for a small game, uh, I can't really, it's, it's hard for me to justify spending that much on it because I want to generally get these games, you know, sell these games made and relatively cheaply. But yeah, I've seen those. Like I said, still the best values I've seen has been that uh, one, uh, about 10.1 inch screen from uh, Seed Studio and uh, that Elanon. Yeah, I think your best option is just like uh, eBay and some kind of Android tablet. You can find them pretty cheap. Yeah, I'm going to look for an Android tablet. I say I find the right one. And that's going to be nice because I have Wi Fi built in so I can make it, I can make it send scores to the internet. Yeah. Any other questions? In that case, let's eat. Thank you, Adrian, and you provided the, the meaning to life.